Hello, I'm Dr. George Simon, and welcome to another edition of Character Matters. This is the program where we talk about all things uh, character related. Character being that aspect of our personality that reflects our uh, personal integrity, our ethics, our moral centeredness and groundedness. And uh, we're going to be continuing on this program, a series on all about narcissism. This is episode five. We've been delving into the most malignant forms of narcissism. Uh, we've been talking about antisocial personalities, sociopaths and psychopaths. A lot of confusion about these terms, a lot of confusion these days about the nature and types of narcissism. Uh, even though it's a very hot topic, uh, because folks are increasingly recognizing uh, the widespread nature of character dysfunction. Uh, and uh, even though there aren't very many uh, good explanations for the phenomenon, we know it's there. And uh, we know that narcissism is a dimension of personality and character has been on the rise for some time. There are reasons for that. We'll be talking about some of those in another program. But today's program continues a discussion on the most malignant forms of narcissism that expresses itself in the most severely disturbed characters among us, including nature's only known intraspecies predators the psychopaths or the sociopaths, as they are sometimes called, what makes these folks tick, uh, what really drives them, uh, how to uh, protect yourself as best as you can from these types of folks. We're going to be talking about all of that over the next couple of episodes. So I hope you'll stay with us here as we delve into uh, these really important uh, topics. Now, I've been talking in the past about uh, narcissism being a dimension of personality. Uh, in our day and time, for a variety of reasons, uh, folks never get past even the first commandment of character development that I write about in my book, Character Disturbance, and that I am writing an entire book about uh, presently that should be finished, I hope, in the next couple of months. Uh, originally, the book was to be titled The Ten Commandments of Character. Uh, it's been retitled. I'm still not absolutely sure what the new title will be. I think it's probably going to be something like Provisions for the Journey uh, or Essentials for the Journey. Uh, it speaks to this journey of life and personal development and the things that we need to learn along the way, and that's where the Ten Commandments of Character come in, the lessons that we have to learn along the way in order to become really uh, fulfilled in our potential and to become the most decent uh, and honorable people that we can become. And uh, I am not one of those folks who uh, simply throws up my hands and says that there's nothing to be that can be done. Um, I realize that the problems we face are very daunting. Um, and I realize that many of the problems we face have been with us for a long time, even though there's some evidence that certain problems are getting worse. But I always maintain some hope because I know that above and beyond all else, we human beings are creatures capable of learning and growing. Uh, we're the only species that requires so much in the way of socialization effort uh, to um, allow us to function in an adaptive way. I mean, just think about it. Uh, we start out as infants that, that can't even take care of ourselves. In many species, uh, uh, young, in, uh, young uh, members uh, of a species will have to learn how to get out uh, in the world on their own and make their way and survive and prosper uh, and have their own families at a very, very early age. That's not true for human beings. It takes 
many, many uh, minutes, many, many hours, 24 hours a day, um, for days on end, months on end, years on end, many times all the way into midlife to properly socialize a human being. That's a lot of learning. And there's a lot of things that can hang up uh, learning along the way. Uh, and we'll, we'll be talking about some of those things in some of the episodes. But suffice it to say that I know that people can and do change and grow. Uh, if you're listening to me, I dare say that you know for a fact that you are not the same person that you were 5, 10, 15 years ago. You're just not the same person. And hopefully, if you had the necessary open heart, you reckoned honestly with some of the uh, foibles, uh, some of the mistakes, uh, some of the errors in judgment that you made, and you uh, made some course corrections. You learned some things and you now function more adaptively than you did at some point in the past. So uh, that's the hope that I hold. Now I am not uh, thinking in a Pollyanna style here. I know that the learning curve is extremely steep if not impossible for certain individuals who have certain characteristics, especially if they have characteristics that are just kind of built into them, are part of their innate structure contributing to their character development. I know that the learning curve for some of these folks is not only steep, but maybe virtually impossible. I know that. Um, so in this discussion, be aware that the main point that I make in all four of my books, and that gets so little attention still, but the research continues to bear this out, that the main point that I make is character dysfunction is like so many other disturbances that we've come to reckon with. For example, like the autistic uh, disorders. We now know that so many things that we thought we could neatly categorize, is it this or is it that? Does it have these characteristics or that characteristics? So many things we th thought we could put in a nice little pigeonhole exist along a spectrum of both type and severity. And that's the way it is with character disturbance. Now in the last couple of programs, we've begun a discussion about folks at the very far or extreme end of the character disturbance spectrum. These are the folks that are the most malignantly narcissistic. And by malignantly narcissistic, we mean that their narcissism goes beyond mere mm, pomposity, haughtiness, it goes beyond uh, a compensatory kind of need to put on a bravado or braggadocio. There are some folks who at their very core uh, overestimate their worth, who overly appraise themselves and who have virtually no respect and certainly will not bow down to any higher power. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about a God figure. I'm talking about anything bigger. There are some folks among us who have no regard for anything outside of themselves. They haven't gotten beyond the very first of the 10 commandments of character development that I talk about in my books, especially my book, Character Disturbance. That first commandment is all about seeing the bigger picture, about expanding one's awareness. You know, as infants, it's natural for us not only to see ourselves at the center of the universe, 
but also to see everything around us, especially the things that we like, as extensions of ourselves. This is how we start out in life. Some people never grow out of this properly. So for some folks, it's all about them, purely and simply. They've never passed the stage of seeing everything as being all about themselves and or an extension of themselves. They lack not only awareness of something bigger, but there are two things that really influence their behavior more than anything else. If they are aware of something bigger, if they're aware of more out there than just them, they pay it no regard. In other words, they can't love. They can't have any positive regard for anything other or anyone other than themselves. And they absolutely refuse because they sincerely believe in their own special status and their own greatness. They refuse to kowtow. They refuse to subordinate themselves to anything bigger. It's all about them purely and simply. And that becomes very, very malignant when two factors are present. One is when the person is severely lacking in the capacity for empathy, the ability to feel for others, to have compassion and concern about anything. And we know, we know from current research that some folks innately are impaired in their ability to care. Now we don't know enough to know that all psychopaths uh, are wired differently from birth. We don't know that. There's a lot of folks that assert that. The research is not clear on that. The research, as a matter of fact, doesn't even point that way. We know from research that the brains of folks that we call psychopathic, and I'll talk a little bit more about that term in just a minute and where it comes from. Um, we know that the brains of psychopaths work differently than normal folks. But we don't know that that's because the wiring of the brain is different from the start. We do not know that. Now, in some cases that can be true, but the brain is an amazingly plastic instrument. And we also know that certain events, especially traumatic events, can really profoundly impact brain development. So anybody that tells you that we now know that certain folks are just born that way is not telling the truth. They're, they're overly interpreting the data. That's very clear. But we also do know for sure that some folks are innately predisposed to have great difficulty caring, maybe no ability to care. So that's the one element that makes narcissism quite malignant. The other element has to do with conscience formation and its absence. And actually that's uh, one of the uh, things that was observed early on by early researchers that led to the term psychopath in the first place. You see, uh, a researcher by the name of Hervé Kleckley was working with a certain type of uh, criminal and noticed they had no apparent remorse or compunctions at all about some of the things that they had done that were horrendous by any standards. Um, and they seemed to have a, a, a weird kind of glibness about themselves and life in general. 
They simply didn't care who they hurt, how they hurt others. And um, he noticed this senseless, it didn't make any sense. It was not rational. Senseless, remorseless, callous use and abuse of others and considered it a form of insanity. And that's where we actually get the, the term psychopath. Psycho standing for uh, the mind and the path or the pathological part having to do with the disease uh, aspect. So basically, psychopath means diseased mind. Um, Cleckley thought these heartless predators among us were crazy. Who in the world outside of an insane person would do things that made no sense to most folks who have some kind of conscience. It didn't make any sense to him. So in today's program, what I'm going to try and do is make some sense of, the, of, of why the most malignant narcissists among us, the folks we sometimes call sociopaths, psychopaths, what really drives them what makes their behavior seem so irrational, even crazy, because it appears that they act without conscience at all, and it's just not normal to have no conscience. So this um, lack of any kind of normal human conscience uh, is the other big factor. The fact that uh, folks consider themselves entitled, superior, that it's all about them, and they have no compunctions, nothing to hold them back. I'm going to be talking a lot uh, today about what contributes to that, what kind of attitude development, what kinds of ways of thinking lead a person to turn out that way, uh, and uh, what, if anything, can be done about it. So uh, let, let's take a look at these factors uh, a little bit more deeply, uh, because this most malignant form of narcissism uh, that we find in psychopathy or sociopathy, uh, and by the way, uh, the term psychopath, which was originally thought to be a form of insanity, as I mentioned, fell into disuse uh, when uh, researchers started focusing on the socially predatory nature of these individuals, these heartless predators who uh, preyed upon everyone they could think of uh, in society. And that's how we developed the term sociopath, uh, because it was, a, uh, it was a social disease. It was a social relationship disease uh, also not just a disease of the mind. And so the social aspects of, uh, of these predators' behavior became the focus. But in any case, malignant narcissism is at the core. And what makes narcissism malignant, what distinguishes it from just the garden variety, if you will, narcissism, is this highly impaired conscience. No no seeming moral compass. This wanton use and abuse of others uh, based in heartlessness, the inability to care, no empathy, and no conscience. And so I'm going to be talking about the roots of that right now. You know, narcissism exists on a spectrum. It's a contributor to a lot of different personality dysfunctions. And the powers that be that, uh, that classify personality disorders will eventually, I believe, this is where many folks uh, on the investigative committees are heading, I, I believe, they will eventually 
have one classification for a personality disorder, and then they will have uh, clinicians specify uh, what uh, features or what uh, characteristics comprise this personality disorder. And um, with narcissism in its milder forms and in its uh, more compensatory or neurotic uh, type, a person does have some degree of conscience. They do have some capacity to care. But for whatever reason, sometimes born of trauma, sometimes born of not getting enough attention or whatever the case may be, uh, in a compensatory way, these folks act all that, even though inwardly they don't necessarily feel all that. And for years and years and years, we thought that these were the only kinds of narcissists out there. And whenever we saw a narcissist uh, uh, in treatment, especially clinicians just assumed that underneath it all, they must have low self-esteem, they must be struggling with a low sense of self-worth. They must be insecure. Uh, that's why they made those constant bids for attention. And uh, so the thought was, well, if they get enough of the validation that they seek, that'll help fix things. Well, we now know, or at least we should know, unfortunately, there are a lot of clinicians out there who don't get it who just don't get it. But we now know that there's a very, very different type of narcissism. I first discovered this in my clinical research long before I wrote my second book, Character Disturbance. And I mentioned it briefly in my first book. Uh, I had already been doing clinical case studies and I had been looking carefully at the very different narcissistic types that I was seeing in clinical practice. And, I, and I, I just knew that there were two different major types. And this is long before any research supported the notion. Now the research is clear, very, very clear. And uh, the type that we uh, call now compensatory or vulnerable, and that I call in my books, uh, neurotic is in the minority these days, especially with men. Uh, we don't know why that's true. Uh, these days, the, in, the research is saying that uh, most of the time when you see narcissism in women, the majority of the time, you're looking at the more compensatory or vulnerable uh, type or more neurotic type. With men, the vice versa is true. With men, most of the time, when you're seeing narcissism, it's mostly, uh, or the majority of the time, of the grandiose or non-neurotic or character disturbed type, where there's a lack of empathy. The degree to which empathy is lacking determines how malignant the narcissism is. And there's a degree, and there's a lack of good conscience. And the degree to which conscience is lacking also helps determine how malignant the narcissism is and how dangerous the person is, especially in a relationship. So these are the things we're learning. We're also learning that when it comes to empathy. Uh, there are two different characteristics that even the most seriously disturbed, the most malignantly narcissistic people out there uh, can do. And that is, um, they can either be completely devoid of empathy capacity, or they can have some limited empathy capacity, but they can also do something that most of us simply can't do. And that is they can turn it off at will. They can mentally wall off feelings when they're in predatory mode. In other words, when they want to callously, selfishly, 
use and abuse somebody for their own personal gain, maybe even cause somebody great harm, when they want to do this, they can, if they have some degree of human feeling, they can turn it off. They can mentally close it off or compartmentalize it, as we say. So it's not that they're completely heartless, but when they're in predatory mode, when they're actually about the business of victimizing someone else, they can act heartlessly. So the victim doesn't really care whether the person had a capacity to care and just turned it off. All they know is that during their victimization, their abuser was acting without heart. You know, so it doesn't really matter, but it's important to recognize uh, what we're learning about these most malignant narcissists. Now, I talk in both uh, in sheep's clothing and in character disturbance, and I'm talking at length in my newest book under development about what fuels this most malignant form of narcissism. And um, as I mentioned before, this first commandment about having some relationship, perceiving some relationship with something bigger, stepping outside of yourself, not taking yourself so seriously, but seeing yourself as a part of something bigger. Well, the pathologically grandiose among us have trouble recognizing anything bigger. They stay so stuck in their character development that they can't even imagine something bigger. That's pure grandiose narcissism. Now there are some individuals who come to some realization that there are higher powers out there that there are forces to contend with in this world. But they're at war with them. They are determined to be dominant. And they feel entitled to be dominant. And they see that conscience that most of us have, and that most of the time holds us back from doing certain things that we might be tempted to do, but just couldn't live with ourselves if we did, so that we get held back basically by our own internal moral compass. They see all that as nothing but a weakness and they have disdain for it. They have nothing but disdain for it. They consider it evidence that people who have this thing called conscience and who hold themselves back and don't just always go for the things that they want, regardless of who it might hurt, they regard those folks as inherently inferior. And because they see themselves as superior and entitled and special, this gives them license to prey upon those that they consider worthless. They don't have any respect for the value of the other person. It's really um, tragic. And it's a particularly tragic that in our days, a more rampant narcissism and more rampant narcissism of the more malignant type and more rampant narcissism of the non-compensatory or grandiose type where people don't just think they're all that as a cover for feeling insecure, but really truly do believe in their own greatness and really consider themselves special and really do consider themselves all that matter these are the folks that when they have little to no heart and little to no conscience to stop them, 
will callously, remorselessly, senselessly use and abuse others. And we'll be talking more about these more, most malignant narcissists and the games that they play, the ways that they toy with, sometimes even torture, uh, those uh, that they consider inferior anyway. We'll talk more about them in the next edition of Character Matters. And I invite you to go to the blog where I posted uh, another article related to this topic um, at drgeorgesimon.com. That's D-R-G-E-O-R-G-E-S-I-M-O-N.com. And I also invite you to avail yourself of my books, In Sheep's Clothing, Understanding and Dealing with Manipulative People, Character Disturbance, The Phenomenon of Our Age. This is the book that talks about all the various disturbed characters out there, how to really understand them, and most especially, how to get the right kind of help when you really need to find it. Uh, and my book, How Did We End Up Here? There's Barbara's Guide uh, to This uh, Character Disturbed World of Ours, and The Judas Syndrome, uh, my only book, directed toward the uh, members of the Christian faith community about how uh, faith can genuinely help transform a life. So uh, with that, I'll conclude another episode of Character Matters, the new Character Matters, and uh, hope to see you again next time. I'm Dr. George Simon. Thanks for listening. Take care. <music>